Hello everyone, today we talk about bludgeoning weapons in medieval times, clubs, maces, causing a blunt trauma. The first instrument of death in military history, as a matter of fact, club and mace were the first weapons used by men. As a matter of fact, such weapons as simple as effective, in fact, would uh, outlive uh, many other uh, once uh, throughout history, uh, even when uh, other weapons got more refined thanks to their devastating strength, uh, clubs, maces never stopped being wielded really, even until the Great War. And there is an enormous tradition of uh, individual training, right, to level of fact of athleticism, of uh, mental, physical uh, control strength, um, agility, etc., that uh, was quite intensively cultivated historically, all right? In any case, it was in the Middle Ages that clubs, maces, the latter especially, reached their most mature form, and the general reason, always considering, of course, that, you know, as I often discuss say, the idea of Middle Ages is, is arbitrary, like the one of any other year, and that, of course, we're talking about a wide um, uh, amounts of time and, and space. But the point being that the Middle Ages were literally the time in history in which the spread of armor was the greatest. The peak, as a matter of fact, was the 15th century, and as we will see now with Gothic uh, Morgensterns, right, we get to that highest refinement, in fact, of anti-armor uh, effectiveness, and also usage, right, as far, especially as anti, say, um, armor weapon wielded by the uh, same armored warriors what was concerned, and uh, as we will see there, there is a very m much, m much older and ancestral uh, me archetypal meaning about that, but that's fundamentally the reason, right? For the rest, um, bludgeoning weapons had been present everywhere. You can argue that whenever you find armor, you find this kind of blunt uh, trauma uh, weapons because they are basically able to deliver with this incredible uh, brutality, uh, this enormous amount of force also underneath the armor, right? And so uh, not much uh, piercing it, Right, which um, could also happen with weapons that were a bit in between, like the uh, the the cut, and but still by being quite bulky, the the very heavy sort of uh, of blow of that kind. For, think about the halberd. By the way, today we will not talk about uh, pole arms um, or even about uh, war hammers or stuff like that, because th those were more composite weapons, right, that combined. We will talk about this also about the trusting um, element. Uh, this exists in the good and dark, other sort of um, weaponry that sometimes is also not entirely clear as far as um, the actual um, characteristics um, of the, the one that was actually used uh, en masse, right? Most people stop to the, the materialistic side of the story uh, somebody would say the archaeological one, but the point is that you can even have evidence of, say, how um, uh, Japan the Stave could be made, but it, it's still, first of all, a very generic term, and still you're not on the battlefield of Courtrai to see what, I don't know, Flemish infantry actually wielded, because you don't have the thousands of, of weapons as they were used on that day in that battlefield. So, it's actually a much more obscure world than it seems. That's the reason why I make my unit types uh, series, because we can look um, at also at, at the variation, actually, of equipment that always exists, and we would be surprised to see how uh, free, more frequent uh, such weapons were, for example, even among, say, the Romans. For example, Roman legionnaires uh, trained with clubs, notorious, as basically any other people um, at the time, there were still traditions in other countries, such as, I don't know, in, in, in the Caucasus, for example, there is um, a lot of this sport even practiced, uh, I suppose, um, as a broader form, again, of um, psychophysical training. But this is a, a 
another issue we can make other videos about this today we talk mostly about um, the development or the most uh, apparent we could say the most evident weapons that we associate with properly the, the, the stereotypical medieval mace and uh, especially towards the later Middle Ages but there is a great prehistory to that too so at first glance blunt weapons do not seem to have anything noble Right, and as we will see, the understanding uh, of say this weapon's function also in archetypal meaning did vary over time. Right, at times clubs were actually a great symbol of, of power. Right, think about the baton. Uh, we will see it now, etc. Um, other times they seem to be a very primitive, rough, and somehow low weapon well, that, that the peasants would use uh, and so on and this naturally changed over time on the basis of the different social modifications for which also the uh, medieval elite began to use naturally mu much more sophisticated and effective weapons the most sophisticated flanged mace uh, designed to affect uh, very geometrically and uh, physically uh, demolish um, armor uh, etc. And so, of course, there were different things in between, right? This forms, but you understand the uh, the divide at that point that existed between a guy wielding that weapon that entailed also a certain type of of, of defense, right? Um, and one of a type of desperate peasant that just wanted to furiously knock out one of these guys, and sometimes it did succeed, right? Always considering that. Of course, um, nothing was absolutely at the extremes, right? There are always difficulties, and asymmetry is tends to be gapped in warfare, even though it's always there by definition. Um, as we were saying before, these rough weapons were first the, the first ones used by men, right? Clubs taken from, for example, the famers of large animals were widespread in every prehistoric culture. And even later, this type of weapon, as primitive as effective, established itself, was refined in the most diverse regions and peoples. A bas-relief dating back 5,000 years, found in Kernosovka, north of the Black Sea, is the oldest depiction of men armed with clubs. But from Africa to Polynesia, from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean to the Americas, bludgeoning weapons appear in every shape and size. Uh, this is a universality shared, as you know, by other weapons as well. Spears, uh, slash javelins, bows, etc. But the club is really the most uh, uh, immediately pervasive, right? Just because of the elementary function and the somehow also relatively distinctive one that it has, right? Even primates use it when our somehow rational element in in the heat of combat or of, of the, the, the chaos of war um, basically is, is lost, you have even uh, totally uh, professionally trained uh, special servicemen that start using their their assault rifle like like a club, right? And sometimes it, it does work, as a matter of fact, because nothing here, say, from one side or the other can be purely rational, right? There are certain limits and boundaries. But the sense, again, of, you know, immediately like a smashing your opponent, um, wielding these objects from uh, top, from to to bottom and f basically disintegrating uh, uh, a, every physical consistency that lays in between is uh, is of course something very relatable, right? Uh, now um, this is paralleled culturally in in even in myth, right? That in which uh, such uh, weapons play leading roles, given that for example the Indo-European uh, divinities face combat armed with clubs uh, or, or, or maces or hammers uh, that are somehow even ambiguous, right? There are, you know, if you think about Thor's hammer, what is it exactly, right? Is there a, 
a mechanically, a physically standard type of, it can be lots of things at, at the same time. It can be an axe, can be a hammer, can be a club, can be something you know, uh, in between all this stuff, because again, uh, certain weapons are also very, um, very customized, if you want. Uh, and in this sense, also underlining the superhuman strength of of the character, meaning that the the, the most extraordinary in this weapon, and naturally, the more gifted the uh, the man who is able to wield it, which uh, it is true, right? Uh, in as much as you know, the, the more complex, the more effective weapon, definitely much greater exercise and control and physical prowess is, is, is necessary. Um, the uh, Vedic god Indra, the hero of the Mahabharata, the Hindu guardian god Vayu, the heroes of Iranian mythology Rostam, Garsham, uh, the western ones, such as Orion, Hercules and the aforementioned Thor, well, they all use the, this kind of weapon. The fascinating thing is that very often, if you think about the uh, Shanamas, for example, medieval times uh, that uh, really talk to us about ancient um, Indo-European epos, right, represent this, this heroes in the most, uh, just like in the West, right, in the most typically medieval armor. And the mace is there, of course, and of course declined consequently to the various uh, you know, times and places uh, for us to, to to admire. The club is a terrible weapon, really. Uh, capable of fracturing bones and mangling flesh. Uh, it, it's also difficult to defend against it, as it is capable of stunning even a man with his head protected by a helmet, right? And again, causing certain blunt trauma underneath the armor for which you can simply have something broken within uh, in your vessels, in your structure, and, you know, bleeding white from, from the within. Um, uh, a club blow is capable of shattering even a sturdy shield. So the point is, why wasn't this weapon more uh, universal when things got uh, somehow more sophisticated in the art of war? Well, for the obvious reason that it um, by itself exposes a lot the wielder to to the enemy in the first place, right? You have to come quite close to him. You have to deliver this blow in order to be affected with a great force, and in order to do so, you lose time and energy to a degree that uh, can be compensated with more sophisticated weapons, even a spear that keeps you a greater distance, can um, hit, like, in, even in very uh, small uncovered parts, let's say, or when you are loading to deliver this blow, there is also uh, an obvious realization that a double-handed club, right, uh, leaves you basically exposed to, um, say, at least it doesn't make you wield a shield effectively, right, so you have to, if anything, to have a smaller club and a shield at the same time, so there were this kind of combinations as we will see, but everything that you see happening on uh, in, on battlefields historically is the most comprehensive um, fruit of rationalization of of actual ergonomy and uh, intelligent compromise that you uh, can find. Um, in any case, uh, as we will see, the club does maintain this sort of, you know, primal archetypal characteristic. There are different weapons that do. You can argue that the spear at some point becomes the, the most uh, noble, divinely connect later on the sword, right? And if you talk to different uh, historians for, for specializing in different eras, they will look at Liu in a sinister way because they've been told that, say, I don't know, if, if they're modernists, it's just the the sword, or medievalists, is the, the sword, the symbol of everything, as if the, the Langs hadn't had the same thing. Things change over time. Right, uh, and there are also different values attached to different weapons throughout the same times that in part persisting but also changing and calibrating with one another in, in different way. We'll see it now. It's the same example I was doing uh, before of, of the mace of, of the knight and, and the uh, club of the peasant.
right? In any case, in close combat, the mace could break through shields and armor. This is perhaps better uh, evident in ancient times as opposed to medieval times, because um, in spite of you know the 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 say the, the dark legend of the Middle Ages, ancient times were a more primitive and, and poorer time, right? In terms of material wealth of what soldiers were equipped with. Um, and as a consequence, a club could be not just more effective against defenses, but could be just more widespread because the types of troops available were just coming for, from more primitive areas, right? So that, for example, in Central Europe, we find a consistent amount of that. We find, of course, the club used in different ways, um, also, as, as a secondary weapon, some, say, um, tribal units also from, I don't know, North Africa or etc. would use, say, as archers, like a secondary weapon, this kind of, of stuff. And this, considering that such um, weapons could not be just very customized, but they reflected the lifestyle of the people. Um, that could have different type of weapons on the basis, say, for example, also of hunting. Right, and how they normally earn their, their living. And, you know, there is not much of a difference between hunting and, you know, killing a person. Uh, plus, you know, uh, this, this depends on every culture, say, on how they how much exposed they are to warfare, etc. So we'll talk about this another time. But the good example here is, for example, in the armies of Rome, right? Some Germanic auxiliaries, but not just them, um, just more iconically, uh, fought notoriously with knotted clubs using the sword in that case only as a secondary weapon this, this, there's a, of course an enormous debate about this um, because the guy who owned the sword uh, generally speaking preferred the sword over, over the club but there are some instances in which this could be uh, this weapon could be more useful and at least the Germans were uh, say uh, incarnating a bit there the also through the Roman lens, the, the, the archetypal symbol of the, the giant, uh, in that case barbarian, uh, that would smash everything in, also in a more furious and, uh, say, un, uh, unsophisticated way. But that's still, given their sizes and uh, the, the general uh, military context, could achieve great things. And the Romans had a, a great consideration for this. In fact, in uh, not only we can see such Germanic warriors uh, in Trajan's column, tall and powerful, attacking bare-chested, protected only by a small oval shield, but the uh, more meaningfully, the only dead Roman, even though we don't know exactly whether he was a Roman or an auxiliary, because uh, I inserted here even the picture you can see next to the. Uh, to the to the Germanic clubmen, um, uh, what appears to be either a Roman legion or auxiliary that is literally holding with his teeth the hair of a severed head of an enemy, right? Just telling you about the sort of uh, bloody tastes of the same Romans that were kind of excited by these things, uh, probably not less than the same Germans. But the only that uh, uh, in in the Roman forces represented on the column is one of these guys, right? demonstrating the temerity that distinguished the fighters, also because, as you know, auxiliaries were often sent in just to uh, the beginning, right, to uh, do the, the, the dirty work, and uh, eventually just the legionnaires would uh, have this road uh, paved for them by these more impetuous forces that were just trying to emerge. Right, as they were under Roman control and they had to earn their uh, their future uh, in that sense. But they were represented right, uh, in, in this piece of imperial propaganda that uh, wants to 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 exalt the the, the primitive, but uh, somehow uh, we would say the good savage. But in that sense, the Romans had a great respect to their sense of. Uh, individual warrior uh, character of these Germanic auxiliaries on it. And, and that makes you think, right? If you look at um, the general warfare, I, I made videos about Germanic warfare, we'll have to come back on it as well. Um, here, there's not much of a way to, to distinguish the Berserker or the Ulfidnar side from the appearance.
um, the mimicking of the of the of the animal uh, from from these guys, right? This the sense that uh, these were uh, sworn uh, uh, devotees and uh, uh, religious war bands that fought uh, naked or semi-naked, arm- armed only with this more primitive weapons, because the sense is that the technological auxilium was somehow distracting from the spiritual issue that had to make this guys transfiguring in holy combat, right? Um, and probably assuming also certain uh, drugs, at least people think, because of this scarcity of protection, there are lots, again, I've made multiple videos on the animal warriors, um, and uh, I think actually that was an enormous degree of ascetic preparation and of exposure to certain trauma that would at least f- create some, uh, in fact, just spearheads in this, this fashion. I mean, these, these warriors were, in a way, completely dysfunctional, aside from this preparatory fashion, but they were a sort of you know, characteristic still that uh, a complete army like the Roman one wanted to, to have, um, and that um, uh, were, were combined right in, in this fashion with the more disciplined forces. But they had to do with that primal origin. Right? You can't just say, well, they took drugs. Well, even if they did, that's not just about the drugs. It's about how these people lived and their mindset that is much more powerful than, than any drug if you actually stimulate if you if you cultivate it if you strengthen it through this incredible brutality uh, to say the least now it is believed that royal scepters are nothing more themselves than symbolic clubs right from this ancestral um, uh, weaponry uh, at the stations of supreme power among numerous peoples such as the Etruscans the Persians the Romans the symbolism of the scepter is confirmed in the Middle Ages because these weapons, in a sense, get, um, as we've seen, in part refined. In part, they also become just uh, symbolic, somehow, a ritual. This was already present in, in our culture, but it would be, I don't know, the axe. I uh, just made a bit about feudal Rome that talks about that, to think about the fascus, etc. Um, and there is all a symbol behind that, so it's, it's difficult opologically to... Um, to simply find the uh, a genealogical affiliation of all these various weapons just through our uh, our historical evidence, but right uh, the uh, the meaning is is somehow similar, right? The um, the scepters, of course, are associated with the figures of kings and emperors, and these weren't, of course, meant to be clubs. And say, oh, look, this is a scepter. This is not a, a mace, right? But it was a symbolic weapon, uh, um, say a parade one, a ritual one, so it didn't necessarily have to be an actually functional weapon, even though sometimes this was the case, but you you know that, for example, many parades forwards, etc., were just symbolic. They uh, we, we tend also to say, oh, well, now this stuff is so expensive, it's, if it's a parade, uh, th- that it's, it's a parade weapon, even though in that case maybe they, it's, a, it's a fully... Uh, effective weapon if actually brandished there is also the problem of size sometimes giants did exist um, and uh, weapons were as a matter of fact anthropometrically customized like and, and uh, produced but the um, the sense of course is it's that some symbols such as the, the one of the club that was again very primitive and so simply you know, couldn't quite go at war with it at, at certain points in history uh, would be somehow idealized in the uh, in the scepter. Uh, you know that uh, this um, uh, symbolism is associated with uh, rulers up to the present day. Some parliaments and universities in Europe also equip their president with a ceremonial mace. Sometimes the staff of command is a simple knotted stick as a matter of fact uh, the baculum that appears uh, in two scenes of the Bayeux tapestry uh, which narrates the Norman conquest of England in the 11th century is none other than, than this as a matter of fact and you see that even throughout the middle ages think about the the highly stylized um, uh, Italian condottieri portrait for example they show you this, this baton that is essentially what would remain in fact in the armies um, from that time onwards was already just a symbolic um, thing while 
these guys also uh, wielded maces um, in in actual combat, right? But um, again, the symbol is important. The meaning is important, also in warfare and especially in the role of command, right? Even to the point of military dysfunctionality. I mean, it's just like the, the case of I don't know, um, you know, the the halberds uh, remaining throughout 18th century warfare among the, the NCOs or this kind of stuff, right? In more more um, obsolete weapons that were they weren't useless, right? You find this anachronism. Again, during World War the First you still find maces, clubs, this stuff. But um the 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 point being that uh you uh, of course you you can find certain weapons being out there that are not quite functional in a doctrinal sense but they can still especially from an individual point of view make their job especially bases uh, or at least you know in uh among others right and the story goes that when word spread among the normans that their leader william had been um essentially killed in uh, the Battle of Hastings, he raised his helmet and rode in front of his ranks to be recognized and assured them, brandishing the baton of command. Um, and that also has a reason. So what what is the point with especially equestrian culture and clubs? Because uh, maces, too. We have seen it often in the videos about, uh, say, Turco-Mongolian um, cavalry. It's not the only thing, right? The the simple idea, actually, the, the most obvious one is is related again to armor, uh, and the fact that Wufot on horseback normally was also better armored. Naturally, this is true compared to 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 infantry. So in sanitary societies, uh, say in the steps, you have, of course, everybody mounted fundamentally. So that there is a certification there too, but the concept is of course that the baton of command is in the hands of those guys that are more heavily armored to actually engage close distance against any, uh, I'd say, other armored opponents, so with a weapon that is um, anti-armor, um, and that fundamentally uh, are armored uh, to, the, the, uh, the, to the degree that such close distance that just a maze fundamentally allows to engage the enemy uh, through uh, uh, is able to 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 protect them uh, so that uh, they can take blows themselves without any much of a significant idea. So the idea that Wu used these weapons, especially in the times in which armor began to spread, etc., was somehow the better guy, uh, is the concept of this all. And there was, however, a sort of, um, you know, even war banters about the, the use of clubs that surely can't make us trace that parallelism between, say, the German clubsmen and, say, I don't know, the Seljuk horsemen. The latter of which, um, especially the younger uh, noblemen, the ones that were tested in the first line of battle, like just like the youth the Germanic tribes, etc., they had to prove their value against the greatest risk. They had to essentially demonstrate they were um, blessed by the divinity with with glory, with victory. They had to essentially go unarmored, as we've seen with the guy on the uh, on Trajan's column, um, and like Seljuk princes still did. For example, Al Alparslan. Uh, the uh, you know the massacre you have that normally like there was a Turkic tradition that had entered in Islam uh, during that time it would have to ride in battle unarmored then eventually if participating to actual fighting would he would protect himself with with a suit but the idea is that he had to appear like that because he didn't have to fear any kind of hit because his moral superiority had to be so great that uh, he could have not been killed anyway just out of sheer promise, and the young um, uh, Turkic um, cavalrymen were meant to do something for which the uh, this this horseman would also not the tail of their horses. That is to reach uh, an armored enemy, so the big tough guy in the situation, and uh, coming that close uh, to him to pull his horse's tail. As a sort of mockery and saying, "Look, I'm, uh, I can do it because I'm, 
uh, I'm, 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 I'm not, because I'm exposing myself in the fray without armor. But also I can't do this, because you're slower with all that armor, and I, uh, and I am lighter. Right, and the sense was that these lightly equipped troops had to go there without armor, but with a mace. Because they had to strike, hopefully, at the armored guy, uh, without, however, being hit. So showing, essentially, that matter didn't, didn't matter. It's a weird game <laughs> word uh, here. But um, spiritual force did. It was enough to beat the enemy. This, this is the concept of the stance behind, basically, all the mythology of these peoples and beyond. Because, again, the concept is that you are um, the, uh, the best one. In, in, in absolute terms, not because of the kind of weapon that is just a, a fallen world auxilium, but your sheer moral force should be able essentially to tame even the most brutal enemies, because that's essentially what the, the power of the mind, the power of the spirit, the divine spark that fundamentally exists within you, uh, fundamentally... Uh, should allow you to do because if you do so you can win everything you can win death herself and this is essentially the the ultimate meaning uh, of this so also the the germanic uh warrior right primitively equipped with a club and without armor and just like a, a small oval shield was the same incarnation of bravery for which this men were sent as we've seen in fact in the same roman army uh, in the front lines um, with this sort of champion um, function. The Romans had had their own when in relatively uh, recent times, like back in, in a few centuries, um, and they still appreciated that kind of, of, of role. Right? These are things that the Romans also generally didn't explicitate, but we know pretty well from an anthropological point of view, also because of um, sources like Trajan's column that shows, among the others, this kind of uh, dynamic, right? This is very important uh, to, to point out, in my opinion. So, at the time of the aforementioned William the Conqueror, you know that Aldo of Bayeux is also represented like as a bishop um, uh, wielding a club, right, at the Battle of Hastings, right? The, 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 the mace was the weapon of choice for uh, for knights after the sword, at least ideally, right? There is also this, the story that bishops allegedly would have preferred the club and the the the, the picture of, of Aldo uh, probably say increased this this say, fueled this theory in part um, because they were told allegedly they should have not spilled blood, etc. Telling the truth, this is not really a thing. Right? There is no evidence overall to point out that bishops would have not used the sword or, or the axe because um, as nice as they were, especially in that time, um, because the idea is if they spilled blood, right, so instead of cutting, right, it would have, instead of, yeah, of cutting, they would have just used the, the smashed internal trauma, things would have been better for them. Right? There is no actual evidence of this. Um, of course, bishops had to be deemed to be pure in a sense, but these were cultures in which the, the warlike lifestyle was so obviously the same compared to lay lords that you can't make that case. Like penitence, as we've seen in multiple videos, existed a bit for every, I mean, for everyone. Uh, of course, the the idea is that the bishop didn't have to be so involved in war like others because it was about the world. Um, uh, rather than the violence per se. Uh, in any case, um, we uh, we definitely see that uh, this weapon was at the time importantly used. It was still a sort of in between, right, more archaic ways of war, and the, the most sophisticated one would develop in, in a couple of centuries, also for individual panoply. So called the Mace of Arms. It was about 60 centimeters long and kept in a pouch hanging from the saddle, quite practically. It was also popular among infantrymen. As we said before, we had uh, always uh, been using these weapons, as we've seen also that the poorest uh, militias, again, were equipped like this. Even, say, even in the aforementioned Celto-Germanic world, the, the clubsmen normally were not even the, the average levy uh, 
trooper that was normally a spearman and had um, somehow more composite equipment in spite of its simplicity but that's how in fact simple a club really is uh, and infantry at the we're talking about the high middle ages um, w preferred a version of the uh, mace of arms uh, with a much longer handle, sometimes even two meters, to be wielded with two hands. Uh, this aspect is fascinating because, of course, it goes in parallels with other two-handed weapons, where you can't use a two-handed sword or two-handed axe on horseback, right? So um, the militants that uh, wanted to use a, a club just to smash um, into uh, an opponent, uh, first of all, had already a sword, um, as, as the primary weapon, and also other side weapons, as a matter of fact, including missile ones, even though they didn't show the, more than much. But the guys on foot, uh, that could be the same militants at some point, but they had to transport the weapon to, in other ways, with retinues, etc., would, um, um, would, uh, would have this mass of things, right? Remember this, uh, I mean, at the time of the Normans, of course, also the double-handed axe was, uh, was around, um, and it was a general sense that the damage, of course, that these weapons could could procure to armor would, in fact, still at this point, render uh, infantries more dangerous than they would become later. In fact, you don't see many clubs around after, say, the mid-12th century, right? With, by the time, which was still, again, a very primitive weapon and somehow an anachronistic one. Um, in any case, uh, this is when the mace becomes uh, smaller, uh, as we were saying. Even the, the, the cavalry one is already. Uh, and this weapon, as it develops throughout the later Middle Ages, had many advantages. Um, first of all, it was a relatively economical weapon. Right Later on, it became more expensive, yes, but nothing in comparison with the in-tune plate armor that was worn and all the other you know, costs, etc., uh, in any case, the object in itself, right, was practical, easy to use. It did not require particular training or dexterity, uh, even though before we said that uh, there was intense training with mace, this was mostly a, a physical preparation, right, a matter, you know, was not about using this weapon, in fact, as a primary one on a regular basis, but just about, say, fluidifying your moves, controlling uh, your body, etc., uh, and just becoming more robust, because that's also how it happens, together with and many other exercises. Just the club is, in fact, effective um, in as much as it is. Here we're talking about maces already, but it's, it's in a moment in which these things are becoming, say, maces, right, from, from clubs. Um, and they, they somehow also become smaller, right? Uh, and they're wielded by people who normally have a much higher level of training, by the way, with other much more complex, sophisticated weapons like the swords that are really uh, evolving, right, and becoming ever, you know, more, more complex. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, cl the effectiveness of these weapons, again, was connected with the strength of the person wielding it, right? It was, it was the most important element in, in making it deadly, fundamentally. Because again, it was an unrefined, simple weapon to use, and it, it's all about how much force you impress in it. And again, if you are already a guy that has the level of athleticism and professionalism to fight in, in armor, like a Miles, etc., you, you really can just use this thing effectively by smashing with all your force. So, as we pointed out in its primordial form this weapon had been nothing more than a sturdy club right made of a single piece of wood thinner at the handle and wider towards the top which was sometimes reinforced and made more deadly thanks to the addition of metal parts uh, spikes etc so to, to make it no skilled smith w was needed by the way um, that's the reason why, again, it can't be simply... It, these are weapons that, I don't know, even the mob, of, you know, if, if you look at the protests of, you know, trade unions, etc., those things like gangs of New York, you could simply put, like, nails into it and make it this an incredibly uh, dangerous weapon. It can cause enormous damage, even cutting, right? Because that's how eventually some of these weapons would evolve towards, but um, everybody can do them. Uh, again, um, anyone could obtain it, 
also at a modest expense. In fact, the nailed mace was a model equipped with spikes fixed in the upper part, or with nails, with conical or diamond heads. And its symmetrical shape allowed identical effectiveness regardless of the direction in which it was handled at the angle of impact. This is particularly important that the club especially ha is this, you know, has this, this uh, like the concept is very simple. It, these are weapons with a bar center shifted towards the top uh, where they concentrate also just the mass. They are, and they tend in this sense to be round so that they can pretty much um, it's a uh, deliver much greater force in a concentrated point that is the one is going to touch uh, the enemy first right um, and this is what made it so so uh, fierce uh, so in whichever way you hit naturally impressing the, the necessary force against the say the, the, sorry, that in that vector had to hopefully be uh, perpendicular to, to the to surface of, of the target you wanted to hit so not just you know smashing against everything without concern that uh, you you did know how you did have to know how to use it you would cause horrendous damage the only possible blow um, as you understand was the slash in those circumstances lowered from top to bottom struck diagonally by means of a semicircular movement of the torso and arms right so, uh, as you understand, even before we coded the Japin the Stavi or good and that, uh, the, uh, the, the, the first is the way they actually call it, or candlesticks, etc. There are weapons, uh, specifically. Um, also added trust, right? It's a more complex way of finding it's just like all the, the combining uh, elements you can find in the in the falchion and bill etc you have different types of uh, and there are different terminologies by the way found it also academically expressed in different countries like a weapon is it's considered it's, it's called in a language in a way that is the equivalent to another so in english for example like they they sound differently and when i make this videos I have to to take care of that um in any case just know that at the time also they were called like that as a matter of fact uh, in those countries so uh, the problem is not resolved by being sort of the uh, the name Nazi that says oh no this thing was not called like that because, because very often it's not just that we are in a pre time but it's just like saying uh, you know uh, a halberd is not a polar axe uh, well because why because we we decided to uh, L sort of, I don't know how to say, to, to oh, standardize the, the concept of the two things, even though they can be resumed one in, in the other, right? You know, it's, it all becomes um, a matter of how it, it becomes common to call it in a certain language, but, of course, there is, it's always an approximation dictated by just how, even in pop culture, for example, these things are remembered, right, or uh, thought, and... Uh, the way these weapons evolve sometimes is is much more complex and obscure than than we think. In any case, starting from the 12th century, uh, the ingenuity of craftsmen made uh, of these bludgeoning weapons uh, uh, a much more much more sophisticated tools. The shape of the head took on particular shapes above all to lighten it without reducing its lethality. Importantly enough, um, that's why the spikes, the also the flanges, began to appear because essentially the, the thing was smaller, but it had somehow a greater. Uh, it, first of all, it was more versatile, but it could in fact also cut or pierce, right, rather than simply smashing. Um, and this has to do with different targets, by the way, that were uh, that you could employ it against that were not, first of all, necessarily armored. But also it could have a specific type of armor that was more vulnerable in some joints or whatever. Um, this again, we do not know with practical certainty, just we know that certain shapes, certain, uh, for example, so if you look at war hammers, square sections, etc., for example, it cause more damage to metal structure, right? But it depends what metal structure it is, 
right? That stuff was a thing, especially more after plate armor spread. Then mail had a sort of different, um, it was more vulnerable to trusts of some sort. Um, so we we haven't asked a 12th century knight for that matter ever. They, they didn't tell us about the stuff, but they knew very well what the, the thing was really like. And consider that warfare was also just much more brutal than it seemed. So even though, of course, there is always a, um, say, a, a rational reason behind these changes, still these weapons could be used in very um, unrefined way, and especially the bludgeoning ones, and that that's what they were all about, practically. So this um, this refinement tells us that especially armor was increasing uh, in effectiveness and that you needed something more specialized to um, to to go against right than the older primitive weapon um, it was also a matter of uh, just a compromise of agility and manageability better balance things like these and um, and these all come in a system that has uh, logically to do with the wall um, set there uh, the guy whether he was fighting a horseback or not or which kind of other weapons he had etc um, so that you don't really see by the way the mace becoming again the, the main weapon uh, let's say of a knight until the 15th century, even though there were also pole axes, things like these that were war hammers that were somehow uh, also very, very much out there, like pole axes being, um, especially for men at arms, the the, the deal um, by the 15th century. Now, except, but there were, there were swords, of course, as well, so uh, the mace never went beyond these as well, so it does remain secondary. Um, in any case, uh, speaking of the general shrinking of the dimensions, consider that excessive weight on the head shifts the center of gravity of the club upwards. So it increases the power of the blow, but at the same time it penalizes the chance of controlling the weapon effectively. So if, if for example, the first blow misses the fighter becomes unbalanced and is unlikely to be able to, to land another blow. Um, so uh, it, it has to be immediately after that and it takes time, it takes force, it takes especially power uh, in order to, to, to deliver these hits because uh, armor is not, again, these this, this weapons are supposed to cause a trauma underneath it. But of course um, armor is in part designed to prevent this. It's true that the more uh, flexible armor is, say, male uh, overall, it, 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 even in the way the, the rings are interlocked, etc., are designed to spread the, the, the energy of the blow, not uh, say from the other direction where it arrived, but on the surface. right? But still, if you hit a lot, of course, you're going to smash a lot of stuff, and say, uh, including armor. That people say, well, weapons were not really designed to, to break through armor. Well, it is really, true. say, they, 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 they were equal in that regard. The sense is that if you wanted to destroy a sword, you, had, you would destroy a, a coat of mail as well, right? And you see this also because plate armor comes in um, as long as, uh, as soon as swords stop being uh, uh, produced with an ever sharper edge, which means evidently that plate armor had made a difference, but that still, uh, as long as the, the prevalent coat of mail was around, um, there was, of course, a purpose of cutting through it, right? It wouldn't happen so magically like batter, of course, but, you know, if you smash, and, and there is, of course, a blunt force in, in, in any weapon, telling the truth, it's just a physical matter. So these are questions, again, that um, you have to consider when thinking, like, especially a mace's side weapon, what kind of purpose it would specifically have. And in that regard, yes, you can cause devastating damage probably to, to the same armor, uh, except the most important thing is the damage you do underneath the guy that you're fighting. Um, we see uh, at this point a lightened form 
already frequently used in tournaments because it was essentially capable of knocking down the opponent by stunning him but without inflicting permanent damage at least in theory I mean speak about the 12th century tournaments were really still very violent people died there were actually as battles you can argue that by the 11th century 12th century we were talking about pretty much the same thing people died they had got broken bones etc but of course they were trying to uh, let's say to channel these forces at least as um, outside the, the battlefields proper into more pertinent spaces with less uh, damage to these guys it was a matter of training in some way so there are weapons that also develop that function now um, the handle of the mace was made of wood subsequently uh, with, with a metal rod to the upper end of which the, the head was fixed while a knob was added to the lower end which had the dual function of making the grip more solid and acting as a partial counterweight. Um, this see similar things in different weapons. The hand of the mace underwent countless variations dictated by the studies of specialized smiths that had, as we were saying before, evidently different ideas about the effect that could be uh, produced on, on different targets. Uh, and just based on the capacity of the wielder. Uh, initially, we find a cylinder bristling with pointed nails or conical or pyramidal in shape, while later um, it became a sphere, also studded. Right? Um, so the idea is that things passes from being a cone that can deliver some sort of, yes, concentrated. Uh, force to, to the tip but uh, it it can still be distributed in a more structural way uh, and hopefully to cause a more comprehensive damage to the enemy later the said all the force is concentrated in a in a bowl at the top that is the one that must be frenetically smashed into very specific parts of armor uh, or at least you know in in the same place that you you wanted to to cause damage so that it could be more concentrated in that point because armor naturally had gotten tougher. Now starting from the 15th century also thanks to the influence of gothic fashion that still had a functionality generally speaking and shared by, by other styles by the way the maces gradually became more elaborate until uh, they became authentic works of art in some cases the gothic mace uh, consists of a head composed of a central body surrounded by a variable number of shaped fins um, and people say that they originally uh, that this this maces originally came from Eastern Europe right that the concept arrived in the West via Constantinople which in turn had introduced it thanks to the context with the Sassanian Empire so we're looking at basically the entire arc of the Middle Ages people usually say this because the uh, the sense is that oh yes the influences of the crusades of the east whatever but if you really look at it first of all there had been lots of people who had been using maces in the steps also in Europe that really um, uh, hadn't influenced significantly uh, say western European warfare from millennia right so why during the crusades the, 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 the issue is another right Europe was producing its own types of this uh, weapons that were of course known from abroad but that now were useful because of the social structure was increasing the importance of uh, the knight so the ultra elite guy heavily armored that had to be smashed with this sort of more sophisticated mace of course there were cultures like the Byzantine or the Persian one that had developed this uh, importantly the Turks the Mongols would do the same but Europe would do the same, right? This sense that things spread simply pass from from an, uh, people to another just because the latter could not develop it on its own is something that I never really um, appreciated as a concept. Surely there are influences. We have seen them very often in the videos we make about medieval warfare, about uh, styles, weapons, imitations, souvenirs from the Crusades, etc. But there's also a lot of other way around and um, generally speaking maces in, in a world that was fundamentally about again the sort of feudal uh, leadership 
uh, and also the patrician elements like of the cities you would have the same same type of panoply you would find uh, among other uh, peoples like uh, you you have pretty much the same weapons so it just um, it is also such a, a gradual mechanism that um, you can't quite uh, track it even so historically so that the fact that you don't see you know, it doesn't mean that there wasn't or things weren't going on regarding that. In any case, starting from the 12th century, the mace became significantly lighter, thus becoming much more manageable. The armorers were free to indulge themselves, giving the lugs similar, uh, singular menacing shapes, um, and creating imaginatively uh, sizzled decorations for the handle, the terminal balancing knob of the weapon, uh, and this would go on throughout all the rest uh, of, of the Middle Ages. Um, naturally, there are some variations of uh, maces, but also, generally speaking, of bludgeoning weapons. So I think speaking of the uh, of weapons like the Morning Star, right, or also other, like the the, the, the good and dark, or the flail, right, is, is important because it um, it has something to do also with the with the regional cultures that produce them uh, so due to its particular shape similar to a globe from which rays emanate this maze took the german name of morgenstar meaning morning star uh, in the 16th century in say central uh, Northern Europe, with the aim of following the prevailing late Gothic fashion, the knight's mace acquired a new shape. With the head adorned with a ray of sharp fins uh, at the top and ending in a point, right? This, would, for the first time, uh, it was a weapon that could also be used to strike with thrusts, right? And, he, and truthfully, there were other weapons, tools, this time, because some of, as we will see, the flail was also used in agriculture, right? It was the weapon as much as the one you used to, to beat the, you know, the, the harvest, etc. Um, so, in in um, in practice, in fact, the, uh, especially infantry, the infantrymen, the commoners, had uh, discovered the solution some time before, on July the 11th, 1302, I also made a video about this. The Flemish infantry had defeated notoriously the French knights at Courtrai with the Japin de Stave, which simply means pointy stick in Flemish. Um, and that looked like a club, the, 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 whose metal head culminated in a, in a, in a point, right in a tip. This was a composite weapon. Uh, it was quite effective because it could say uh, these weapons were used not to actually stop cavalry charges but to attack uh, enemy knights when they were already into the enemy formation as it happened at Courtrai, the front line, the front ranks that were the pikemen. And then you had these other guys, not just with the gun attack, there were other types of weapons, right, pole arms, etc. Um, but these ones were pretty effective. Um, and because you could smash as a club, but you could also uh, face, uh, 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 say, an, an idling, a stopped uh, mounted knight with this uh, point, right, and wounding the horse or the guy. So the um, uh, this this is quite interesting because it shows, especially in the early 14th century, how with the this. Mm, temporary um, rise of uh, communal and rural infantries in some areas, by the way. The Flanders were fairly rich, but they didn't have, let's say, they had lots of infantrymen on a regular basis, and there had been experiments against cavalry, but they had never had, let's say, large complex armies of uh, specialized functions. So these were just, again, bourgeois that had, hadn't picked any other weapon before in their hands before um, so it's um, we will talk about this more because I made videos about Flemish warfare explaining a bit that it was overrated this is my um, my <laughs> understanding I mean the, the moral force of the Flemish at Courtrai was not overrated actually that was uh, a big deal right um, but it, the weaponry was just accessory to that, 
right? It's not the weapon or the particular tactic that we're employing, and they had very primitive means, including these ones, right? They didn't have also much of a of a history, right? So um, you can argue that starting from the 14th century, these infantry clubs, if you want to call them like this, were fairly long weapons used mostly as spears, or at least projecting also towards the direction. While the blow was seen even as a secondary function. In fact, it, the, there is some controversy if you look at the Oxford chest, for example, as the um, frescoes in the uh, at Courtrecht uh, in in the uh, in the Church of of the Virgin, etc. You see different type of weapons. Some are candlesticks, or rather than what you would call the, like the golden dag. It wasn't even called like that. It was the Japin de Stave. Um, so. Uh, the 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 candlestick for example uh, was shaped um exactly like the the the, the object uh, that took its name right um it was made of a sh uh, up of a sharp circular plate which was used for cutting fixed to a long handle wheel while at the apex of this the last one had tip uh, a tip inserted for hitting with a thrust as was done with a pike. And if you look at them in in the frescoes, you realize that they were also relatively long. Right. Uh, and uh, and this is in part even at also archaeological units, because again, we find single weapons, but we have no idea, say, on that day, those 8,000, 10,000 Flemish infantrymen, what they, uh, let's say, how, how they were actually kept like. Right. Of course, those pictures are relevant, but they're just pictorial um, evidence and um, you know there wasn't much of a standardization in the way uh, these militias were equipped uh, as well there was sure that functionalization was a level of uniformity there is no doubt these were cities of rich merchants that knew how to materially supply with uh, resources and distributing down this force but they weren't even they were just militias by the way uh, so you know that but in, in a world that was not really subtle in nature this was just essentially communal realities emerging in still what was a decadent feudal system that would however still take over i made a video about this uh there's a medieval flanders playlist that you can check out just to make you understand how uh even though Courtrai stands out as one of the single most important battles of the middle ages especially for this clamorous flemish victory the 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 magic of these weapons, like you can say, the the Swiss Vogue or you know other uh, weapons, is um, very often paraded just because the local historiography wanted to make of, out of this the great deal. It's a bit like the longbow for the English. I mean, nobody denies the incredible success of those uh, of the armies that use these weapons, but it's not because they used those weapons that they were successful. The weapons were adapted to a tactics that was adapted to a moral force that had brought strategically and politically these forces to operate uh, in that way. But uh, these weapons made a, a marginal dif difference te technically, technologically, right? Uh, English armies won brilliantly during the Hundred Years' War because they were pretty damn good armies. Uh, not because they used the longbow rather than, say, the crossbow. Right, and unfortunately, lots of people, I think the majority, still believes this. Um, also, by the way, uh, brutally underestimating instead weapons that uh, reached a much greater level of sophistication in the same years in other regions, and that, however, didn't have solely infantry victories in the, the say, positivistic sense that infantry was the future, etc., you know, the, the, the anti traditional myth and whatever. Um, they are ignored because who cares, right? Even though they they had actually the most advanced weapons that were also integrated in much more advanced armies than these ones um, of Courtrai, for example. Well, never mind that, right? It's more important to weigh this as a sort of important thing uh, that you can make your fortune on some way, and and historical objectivity is just an optional, right? Comparing. Uh, regions, times, etc. Does, doesn't matter, right? 
The Flail also deserves a special mention. This is a jointed club whose head was connected to the handle by a short chain. And there were two versions, by the way, a long one used with two hands by men on foot, and a short one which could also be wielded on horseback with one hand. You understand the reason, it's just like the club before, like the largest ones could be uh, wielded with two hands, in fact, and that's something you can't do on horseback. Um, um, effectively for how, it, especially that the weapon is designed. Um, the first version was called uh, the Bohemian Scourge, because it was that nation's favorite weapon, at least it's associated um, with the peasant uh, tool used to shell cereals used by all the armies of the revolting plebs from the Hussite Wars 1419 1497 to the German peasant revolts. So it was famous in Central Europe like this, you know, the Hussites spread, also they, they fled eventually from Bohemia in large numbers, they uh, arrived in Germany, they brought together uh, to, with them their revolutionary ideas, plus also the, their weapons, right? Um, there is, uh, in here, you understand also a very simple origin of the weapon, right, the, from agriculture. There is no specific tactical reason why it was used more than others. It was still a bludgeoning weapon because, uh, you see how it works, it had a long handle and an elongated drop-shaped head often reinforced by nails, while the joint was limited to a few links of chain, right? Um, th there was a short version called the Captain Morgenstern, so the morning star with chain, in fact, so it's a bit like the most um, bizarre and also least used uh, of these types of weapons you see in very often in medievalism, uh, like, you know, those things for kids, etc., this sort of in fact, flail uh, women would have, would have been very dangerous also for those who used them in, in a, such a uh, wild way as it's usually depicted. And it had actually a, another function. Um, so this this ladder, it was equipped with one or more heads connected by long chains, it was uh, instead brought seemingly, by the way, by the nomadic horsemen of the steppes, uh, who spread in countries like Hungary, Romania, and Poland, where it was also known as Kisten. Um, so these two weapons were fundamentally the same thing, except uh, the first one, say that they, they could be used essentially in the same way, right? Uh, the latter one was also connected to the handle by a ladder strap. It was initially made of bone, it's something more primitive, organic, but soon became bronze and then iron bristling with, with spikes. Then the shape was so terrible and characteristic that we often see in a period in costume films. Um, in this area of Central Eastern Europe, basically uh, you have these two types of weapons more, as we'll see now, than in Western Europe, where it did spread but not as much as the um, the original types. Why? First of all, the peasantry. Again, there were huge issues, again, like the Bohemian Revolt, the German Peasant War, uh, and all this stuff. Um, the the agricultural tools facilitated the use of this stuff that was uh, just, it could be, said so you could switch, the, the handle could be essentially the same, while the, the head, if not maybe a bit better calibrated in weight, and then the head just could had to be made in tougher materials. I mean, even wood could harm, but I mean, let's, let's be honest, uh, the the spikes and the, the heavier, the specific weight, right, was, was more important than the head. Um, the, the most important difference, uh, as we've seen, is that the first weapon was used mostly by the peasantry on foot, and as a consequence, it had mostly a, a, a certain type of employment. Usually, it was essentially uh, slammed against the shields, of the opponent so that the, fl the flail could literally smash, the, the, the handle could stop, but all the force that had gathered could be transferred, this rotatory movement of the of the hand, to smash into the head of the opponent behind the shield. This was the, the most um, obvious use of the weapon, right? Um, and in this sense, it was pretty effective. Consider the the who signed Wagenberg and the you know the, these guys from the same wagons, sometimes smashing uh, the heads of the knights in front of them, uh, and this kind of things. Naturally, in an optimistic way, uh, there were other weapons, including guns and other 
can openers that worked even better but this was still better than nothing this is what they had again it's not the technology that matters here it's what they found themselves in their hands because that's essentially the point um, when you want to kill someone in front of you what matters is not what you have in your hands or how much you want to kill them, right the cavalry version was somehow less um, uh, less um, popular in a way, not just because, of course, it was used by people that fighting on foot, on, on horseback, excuse me, were richer on a regular basis, so they were less, they were the elite, also numerically speaking. But because objectively it was a type of weapon that was better suited for step warfare, in which I made lots of videos about step warfare, essentially, especially towards the, middle, the, the end of the Middle Ages, you have the sedentary world of Europe that gets ever tougher, with crossbows and guns against the uh, the nomads that had always had the lower hand compared to the sanitaries and that were more about uh, hit and run tactics, skirmishes. So passing by with this thing, it's a bit like the concept of the saber, right? Aside from the different sizes and and massiveness there, it's it's just something that works better passing by, right? Not sticking this thing in front like using it like a bar to smash into an enemy armor, but rather cutting. Like also in, in Eastern Europe, you have tendentially less armor than elsewhere, so that worked fairly well. And this weapon was, by the way, brutal. Right? You could, you know, imagine, you know, somebody's head exploding like a watermelon if you know somebody uh, launched gallops smash with this flail's head in, into your own. Um, so it's uh, it's really that brutal. But as you understand, it works less when you meet with heavily armored opponents. You have it's a sort of solo weapon in that regard. You can't quite functionalize a cavalry charge or any other employment of the shock charge through this type of weapon. So that it was also kind of a side one. So that, of course, also step warfare was about shock charges alternated with missile fire mostly. But it could be an interesting side weapon, um, and it somehow spread. Uh, all over, and uh, again, the gloomy, bloody picture of the Hussite revolt, etc., it becomes picturesque. It was very popularized. Um, also, this one was probably overrated in terms, uh, in tactical terms, at least based on technical issues. Right, the Hussites were good at what they did because of the particular political and strategic situation, the moral force they had, the desperation. Um, and uh, these weapons were surely used in an effective way, don't get me wrong, they helped, but they weren't individually the game changer, per se. Uh, this is very important. Now, the flail in Western Europe had a little spread, where, although it was reproduced in various illustrations of the time, which placed the weapon in the hands of nobles on horseback. Uh, and I inserted here some picture, and sometimes it's, again, uh, illuminations are somehow poetic in the way they represent things, um, but uh, very often, like, this huge spiked ball, uh, not necessarily the, mostly the, the head as a, as a bar, that, as it was more usually employed, um, figures uh, so much. Uh, it, it was definitely a, a weapon associated also, as we'll see now, with some, some demonic force, maybe, because it was wielded also by rebel peasants or terrible barbarians, right? Uh, whether the flail was used on horseback, held with one hand, is a debated issue among us, uh, scholars of uh, apology. The specimens preserved in Western European museums are of uncertain authenticity. At best, I inserted some of them are replicas, right? Uh, some are outright fakes manufactured in the Romantic Age and attemptively dispatched as originals. But this is also a problem of medieval archaeologists that, again, as we were saying before, most of the times we do not know what was actually wielded uh, on the battlefields, uh, how spread these weapons were and how they work in, in those battles that we can't see. In any case, the battle accounts do not tell us how they worked. Uh, so there are some specific limits that you can't quite... You know, pe people who do not study these things in depth think that there is always a beyond that you can know. No, unfortunately history is not like that, at least it is possible to go always beyond, but not in the sense that you can magically find out <laughs> an evidence about how... Yeah, there is a way to discover how they all these troops uh, were equipped like... Uh, no. Uh, there is not more study sources that haven't been found 
or whatever uh, that will allow you to do that. You have to try if anything to make a criticism of what it could be used or not. Most of this is also just um, speculative, theoretical. Um, in any case, uh, looking at how frequently these flails are present, even in museums, etc., you can consider them as an homage, uh, fake or not, to the extraordinary power of suggestion that the long period of the Middle Ages exercised in the modern world, and the sense of brutality and destructiveness and barbar barbarism of you know, one another. While actually, a medieval warfare was extremely sophisticated, refined, developed, and uh, say brute force was just was necessary, but uh, when channeled in very specific ways. Speaking uh, finally of these uh, articulated mazes, such as the flail, well, they could be uh, very effective in close combat, right, individually. But they also had to be w handled with dexterity because they could be quite dangerous for those who wielded them in the same way, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but you know, I had a, a respectable passion for the Middle Ages since I was a kid, and I bought, but you know, when when you visit medieval places, etc., I bought an actual flail, uh, and I and everybody knows, even just as kids, that you can hurt yourself while playing with it because if you do not, uh, you know, pay attention where it swings, right? So um, this is why they require training, right? This the flail, uh, as such, um, did require more training than the club, obviously. Um, there are so many considerations. Again, it's plenty of channels out there of uh, big uh, scholar glossaria, or you know, it's, it's, it's plenty of hemists who will tell you all the various possible um, implications of using these weapons, especially in conjunction with armor, not just the one of the enemy, but your own. In this case, for example, for say preventing significant damage, um, the flail would remain, however, one of the most, uh, at least iconic, medieval weapons in the modern imagination, or, um, so much so that um, it's considered almost typical of the warrior of the time, at least in the most fantasy-like, at least it was so in After the Langs or something for, for knights and children books, etc. At least when I was a kid, then like, you think that this was weird, <laughs> you know. Um, Maybe, but uh, there are such things. Um, in in any case, the the, the two-handed version, especially, is used by infantry is well attested in documents. The one-handed one, as we've seen, was very rare, at least in the West. Uh, if it was ever actually used, because people wonder about that, right? So, surely it was used, but the uh, relevance of it there is is another matter. Although it was difficult to control, it was still an extremely ingenious weapon it managed as we explained to bypass the shield and even hit the sheltered enemy behind it so to achieve this it was again enough to to hit with the handle against the upper edge of the opponent's shield so that the weight of the spiked ball tied to the chain of the flail acted by force of inertia continuing its deadly rotary motion behind the pr protection of, of, of the enemy there is also another aspect, a bit more moral and cultural one, about the use of clubs. Uh, as uh, we said in uh, at the beginning of the video, there was uh, a different feeling about this weapon over time. Right? In the epos of medieval romances, the uh, unblemished knights, like the one riding uh, the, the white horse, right, uh, representing the Apollonian, symbol of triumph over evil, etc. Well, the guy fights with the lance or the sword, while it's the evil ones, on the other hand, who are often semi-fantastic, gigantic, or monstrous beings, armed with clubs. Thus, the, that weapon, starting from the third quarter of the 12th century, when really chivalric um, literature spreads in a codified way, etc., were considered inferior, not very noble, because they are similar to the clubs used by peasants. It's um, uh, ironic or unironic, depending on how you see it, that still the baton of command was, was there and was derived by such weapons. Um, so, as we were saying before, that from one side, symbolism, tradition, 
preserved um, the sense that the baton derived from this sort of uh, weapon. It was done by just, uh, it's also an instinctive thing, as we were saying before, just like wielding such, like a, like a stick, etc. It gives you more, sort of more control. Uh, it's um, it's something that stimulates your mind, etc. But at the same time, the idea that the club was a bit... Remember the Romans sent out these barbarians uh, with the club, right? That are still barbarians, right? They represent the, um, say, brutal uh, forces of nature that the Apollonian uh, ruler uh, controls and is able to use at its own um, advantage, right? So... It's obvious that in the later Middle Ages, given the uh, secularization even of, of the of the militia of the um, of knighthood, would bring certain weapons, certain uh, even forms of fighting, etc., to be more regulated, to be more standardized, just to be uh, imitated. Just like, like the concept of tournament that becomes an ever less bloody thing uh, in many ways. Uh, it's all thought to be, um, uh, let's say, a reduction of what was the, the previous, like, all-encompassing power that could derive from these weapons by the, by the greatest powers, right, um, of, of the universe. However, to signify how times had changed, you find from the event of Chrétien de Troyes, the following uh, Quote, a villain resembling a moor, fool and hideous beyond measure, was sitting on a stump with a large club in his hand. All right, so the idea is that the primitive brute, this is actually still a sort of um, traditional idea. I mean, the fact that, of course, there was a, um, let's say, a civilizational value in having, um, let's say, developed more powerful realities on earth that as a matter of fact would be able to overwhelm the barbarian was still uh, meant as if you know we are wielding more powerful uh, weapons than the club or at least our earthly clubs right not the ones that gods um, wield naturally here we are in christianity so the sense that somebody could save the world alone was limited to christ so uh, knights were still mirroring that uh, that uh, fight, right? The cosmic clash uh, that would uh, would help uh, to save the world, but they weren't uh, doing it anymore with uh, those older weapons, right? And this is um, a a measure of the limit of the same individual and the idea that clubs would still be used evidently on earth by troops that were somehow simpler less more rough and that didn't manage to use those clubs as the original archetypal one uh is concerned was was all um what mattered because it's not again the weapon it's really the uh the spiritual symbol right the club is technically the thunder if we really want to be specific about that, so something material and divine, per se. So, just a brief note um, about the permanence of uh, clubs uh, in, um, and maces in, um, in Central European tradition. Uh, the, um, the, the, the theater is the Italian front were the Austro-Hungarians that in part had uh, maintained that sort of idea of you know Hussitism among the the Bohemian element, etc. was uh, were probably um, still mm, showing uh, such legacy. In fact, uh, the conquest of a trench involved fierce melee combat in in that war, as you know. Uh, and such weapons um, spread uh, in, on all fronts, right? The Italians, however, used knives, spades, bayonets. Um, soldiers of other nations preferred clubs, so um, the rifles with fixed bayonets were too cumbersome. The soldiers fell back on more 
manageable and effective weapons, right? The reason why the Italians used this the it's not particular one. Um, there was still an effectiveness, of course. Bayonets were, of course, uh, employed as well. But there was this functionalization, and, and clubs were, in the First World War, uh, often self-made during breaks in the fighting with whatever was available, right? Barbed wire, scrap iron, toothed gears. And apparently the Austro-Hungarians loved, uh, loved these blunt weapons also because they belonged to that Bohemian and Magyar tradition, uh, it's debatable whether you know you can impute the that um, uh, that uh, say the national preference to such original uh, importance of flails, maces, and so on. But indeed, there was something about it. Um, I will not digress on it, but just think that the say that world in, in, in the Magyar let's say in the say in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, especially in areas further east, etc., had somehow remained. Like the the the, the uh, you know the, the, the first world war was something that say was fought after just one century when ethnic um uh mm, cavalries from Central Europe, the Balkans, Eastern Europe could still be um, uh, employed. It resembled even the stamp tradition, etc. So um, it's not that far away of, the, of a world, right? It's just a bit different from a Western European perspective. Um, such weapons were used in close combat and to deal the final blow to the wounded, often after, I don't know, gas attacks, for example, etc. It was incredibly brutal, as you understand, but still somehow effective. So when the news spread in Italy, uh, this uh, so-called, at the time, barbarism caused an uprising of popular indignation. But on the other war fronts, this uh, iron, iron maze, as it was called, was considered a weapon, again, like all the others. And just to remain uh, in Italy, there is an interesting uh, uh, legacy, it's a, an interesting um, cultural legacy about maces um, that has to do with the uh, special units of bodyguards in the kings of uh, the Pope, right? Technically, clubsmen were in the service of kings and emperors, because of this sort of capacity of smashing an enemy, it would come a close range um, to uh, to attempt life of this um, let's say these figures, um, and uh, a guard of pontifical uh, clubsmen existed at least since the 12th century. This is very interesting because. You wouldn't think of clubsmen as something even so, uh, say, formal, right, as a type of unit or whatever, especially as bodyguards, but they existed as early as that in Rome to defend the papacy. And around the 16th century, the this unit reached the peak of popularity. So interestingly enough, uh, they equipped themselves with precious silver weapons of course, much was becoming representative, but uh, there was still some some meaning to it. Uh, escorting the Pope on his public outings surrounding the gestatorial chair. And as the centuries passed, of course, the papal uh, 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 clubsmen lost importance. But they would be abolished only by Paul VI in 1968, All right? So just to, to bear in mind that you could find literally in the lifetime of your parents, whatever, this um, this real unit of clubsmen, even in, in a place like Rome. Um, and uh, this is all the more fascinating. And naturally, these videos are general introductions about uh, these types of medieval weapons that we... Um, we are interested in and we celebrate in a, 
in a sort of comprehensive fashion to open to eventually other videos about more um, more important, more um, more relevant uh, in-depth sort of analysis also of the, the single weapons etc. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.